In this video, we're going to talk all about security controls. Most importantly, I'm going to give you actual examples of controls that you can use to keep your company secure. But first, if this is the first time that we're meeting, welcome to my channel. My name is John Good, and here I get to spread my passion for cybersecurity training, tips and tricks, and career advice to help you go further. Remember to smash the thumbs up to like this video, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss future content, Make sure to leave a comment for the YouTube algorithm. If you like my training and you want more, check out my website at johngood.com to get access to full training courses on distracting interruptions or advertisements. Anybody looking to start a career in cybersecurity, check out my Getting Started page for useful resources and a free copy of my ebook on cybersecurity careers. Don't forget to join the community on Discord. The link is down in the description. All right, let's get into the video. Every type of mechanism that we implement for increased security is known as a control. When we talk about controls, we typically refer to both how a control is implemented and the purpose of that control. First, let's address the first question of how controls are implemented. Three major categories of how controls are implemented are technical controls, which use some type of technology to actually improve our security. So firewalls, security software, and authentication are all different examples. We have administrative controls, which focus on processes and procedures for some aspect of security. So incident response plans, business continuity plans, and security awareness are all different forms of administrative controls. And then we have physical controls, which refer to some physical component, and some of the most frequently discussed are locks and fences. Let's talk about some of the specific technical controls that we can implement. Permissions are the allowed actions that either a user or group has on objects, files, folders, systems, and so on. Permissions allow us to be very granular with what users can do. Whitelisting and blacklisting are useful to identify what's allowed and what's not allowed. Whitelisting is where we're only allowing certain things, and blacklisting is where we're rejecting specific things. Think about those definitions for a minute. It can be very, very hard to identify the specific things that we're trying to allow, but it can also be very hard to pick out the specific things that we're trying to reject. Systems and tools allow us to benefit from technology and automation in software, hardware, or firmware. Firewalls are network devices that either permit or deny certain types of traffic based on access control lists or ACLs, which is basically a list of rules. We have intrusion prevention systems, or IPSs, which actually analyze traffic deeper and they stop known attacks. We have intrusion detection systems, which actually perform the same analysis as an IPS, but it's only going to generate alert. It's not going to actually stop it. Data loss prevention, or DLP, are systems that help to prevent data from leaving the organization. Frequently, when we talk about DLP, those systems are monitoring email traffic and media like USB flash drives that you might plug in to take data out of the network. Endpoint detection and response, or EDR, are a newer type of system that's used to analyze endpoints much deeper than we previously could. The idea is to better identify suspicious behavior on systems. Network access control, or NAC, forces systems that are trying to connect to our network to meet a certain level of security. So up-to-date antivirus definitions, up-to-date patches, things like that. Sinkholing redirects traffic from the intended destination to a location of your choice through DNS. This way, traffic doesn't end up at malicious sites. Port security looks at MAC addresses on a switch to make sure that only authorized systems can connect. Sandboxing is a method where we can put systems or software into an isolated area for future analysis. That way, if we find something we don't like, we don't have to have our entire network compromised. Although administrative controls cover a lot of areas to include things like change control that identifies how we implement changes to our network, configuration management to track and approve changes to systems, business continuity and disaster recovery planning so that we can plan for disasters. Personnel security that you need to be aware of includes separation of duties where no single person can carry out multiple parts of a critical task. Separation of duties is great at preventing fraud because multiple people will have to come together and collude in order to do something malicious. A great example would be the person configuring systems and the person auditing are two different people. Succession planning allows us to be ready for somebody who might leave our organization. And then cross-training is where you have people learn secondary roles so that at a moment's notice, they can step in. Cross-training is also valuable for when employees are sick, not just when they leave the organization. Background checks are crucial to make sure that we hire suitable candidates. And then termination involves disabling or deleting all accounts and collecting any assets that that employee might have. You might see terminations handled differently depending on the type. So is it voluntary or involuntary and that person's role in the organization? We're gonna treat IT administrators or people that have elevated rights much differently than just a normal employee because they pose a lot greater risk, especially if they're disgruntled. Dual control is where at least two people are required at the same time to perform an extremely sensitive task. 
some environments are actually gonna call this two-person integrity. One of the most common examples of this is in missile silos, where you would actually see two people on the opposite side of the room have keys, and they have to turn them at the exact same time to get the missiles to launch. Mandatory vacation forces people to take vacations and allows us to actually review their work and potentially identify malicious activity. Now to address the second question, there's a few purposes and controls that you need to be aware of. Preventive controls are those that prevent a threat from being successful. So intrusion prevention systems are a great example of a preventive control. Protective controls allow us to actually look into incidents that have occurred and we can go back and analyze and see what happened and look at them further. An intrusion detection system is a good example of this because it will only alert us of an incident and it won't stop us. Also, SIM tools would be a good example of this. Corrective controls either remediate an incident or they limit the amount of damage that's done. The storing backups are a great example of this type of control. Now, I want you to understand that there's other purposes for controls, such as compensating controls, but for this discussion, these are the ones I want you to focus on. Question of the day, which type of controls do you think are the most difficult to implement? Why do you think that? Let me know down in the comment section below. In this video, we talk all about security controls. Most importantly, I gave you actual examples of controls that you can use in your company to keep yourself secure. As always, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Check out my website at johngood.com for more training about distracting interruptions or advertisements, and I'll see you next time.